I heard it through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. I know sometimes you feel all alone. Call me anytime when you feel all the way down. Oh, 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 oh. Trials and temptations lie at every corner we turn. It's a test from Allah to see if we succeed or not. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين In the name of Allah the compassion and the merciful all praise is due to Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his prophet Muhammad his family and his followers all until the day of resurrection I welcome you to this new episode of Meet Your Advisor here on Huda TV and we always start with a topic that we need to address. And today's topic is very significant because it deals with something that we need to learn about and be prepared to meet. This is the punishment or bliss of the grave. Obviously, the concept of dying and death is something that we all agree upon, that we all believe in, because no one could deny the fact that someday, for every one of us, we will depart this world, we will leave this world, and we will be getting into a different situation. Now, for believers, we know that the Akhirah has, uh, would start immediately after our death, and the first part of the Akhirah, or the... Um, new life, the second life, is uh, life in the grave. Now, life in the grave is called al-barzakh, which is uh, a life in between this life, as the al-hayat al-dunya, and the second life, which is al-akhirah, this particular life and period. Everyone will go through, and everyone will have either a punishment because of their terrible or bad deeds, or will have a bliss and enjoyment, which is the beginning of their enjoyment in the hereafter. Now, this is called Adab al Qabr, wa Naim al Qabr, and this is part of the belief in the last day, in the last day that would, would start for every one of us as soon as this person dies and obviously even before a person dies we they would go through this process of taking their soul from the body and we know from the hadith that a mu'min's uh, or a believer's uh, death will be so easy just like uh, a drop of water coming out of the uh, water uh, container and that's just just a, a, a drop coming out so easily, so smooth. Uh, when this is compared to the soul of the hypocrite or the disbeliever, it would be like uh, getting the thorn out of the uh, uh, wet cotton or, or wool, and you could see how difficult it would be. There would be, uh, with this thorn coming out, it would be lots of, of things, you know, coming, so it would not come out clean and nice, but rather it will take part of it. So think, uh, may Allah forbid for, for all of us, how terrible the soul would come out of the body. And then afterwards, when a person goes into the grave, obviously there are many things awaiting for a person. And if this person is a good person who was always coming forward to the Akhirah. He remembers the Akhirah. He works for the Akhirah, for the second life, for the hereafter. Obviously, they would be so pleased, and Allah would be so pleased with him, and he would send the angels of mercy who will come to him and will greet him. And they will obviously uh, uh, sit him down in the... Uh, uh, they sit 
they set him up uh, because he was laying, obviously, in the grave. Uh, he would sit down. He would be asked the three questions. Who's your uh, Rabb or Lord? And who is, uh, what is your religion? And who is this man that was sent uh, to you? Who's, who, what do you think of this man? Meaning the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And if this person was a person who believed in the Prophet, who knew what exactly he was, he was doing, and he knows that his deen or religion is Al-Islam, his uh, Lord is Allah, and his uh, Prophet was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, obviously he would give the answers, and then they will be giving him something from the Jannah, and he would be so much uh, entertained, and so much, it will be, the grave would be extended for him as long as he can see. Uh, that would be applicable both to men and women alike. And then, obviously, he would come back and return because he will be raised to the, to the heaven. And the first door for heaven will be opened for him. And then the angels will accompany him uh, to the next uh, heaven and then to the next one. So the angels will accompany him as a, as a greeting until he goes all closer to Allah. And Allah will say, I will give you my blessing. I will give you my mercy. And then he will return back to the earth, meaning to the grave, where his soul will be joined with his body again. And then, of course, his grave will be uh, a place of part of, paradise, he will enjoy, he will sit in a blessing, a blessing and then he will say, Oh Allah, uh, let the hereafter come. Rabbi aqim as And then he wants to go back to his own family, to his own wealth, to his own people, because he really enjoyed that so much. And the reverse is true of a person who actually was doing terrible in this life, so it will be the uh, terrible angels will come and, 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 and look at him. They will take him. These are the, the angels of, the, the, of course, the angels are not terrible, but they would be, uh, they would have uh, terrible uh, uh, looking uh, faces. And then it, it's just part of the, the punishment. And he would even not like them. And in even the, the good uh, work will come like, uh, for, for the person earlier, we described, or oh, come and he say, who are you? You have a, gut, a good smell. You, your face is so bright, it's so nice. He would say, I'm your good work. I'm your good deeds. And the same thing for the, and the reverse is for the one who was doing terrible in this life. That's why we need to prepare. We will, everyone will see his good deeds or bad deeds reflected in the life of the grave, so there is going to be a, a, a bliss or, a punish, or punishment in the grave for every one of us. May Allah give us the good uh, uh, bliss and the enjoyment in the grave because we would be indeed blessed by Allah. And of course, the life that we live here would be so good and we would go and follow Allah's commandments and be obedient in what Allah and His Messenger would say and tell us to do and we follow that and what they ask us to abstain from we would abstain and that's that's how how things are going to be for the next life so we need to prepare we need to prepare for the hereafter part of that is is to remember what will await us in in the grave and as people depart we will uh, th get the life again. And, 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 and in fact, when a person is in the grave and uh, he would be asked by the angels about his religion, his uh, Lord and his prophet, he would even hear the stepping of the people who brought him in. He would hear the, the, the sound of their shoes as they are leaving the graveyard and he would be staying there alone. Nothing would help in that place. No uh, wealth, no relatives, 
no status, no job, uh, any, no one would be coming to help this person except one, and that is the good deed. And if there is um, a bad deed that a person has presented, obviously it will be in his company or her company in the grave. So that is something that we, we know from the hadith. This hadith is an authentic hadith that was reported by Al-Bara ibn Azib, uh, عنه, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, which was reported by Al-Imam Ahmad in his great book of the hadith collection, Al-Musnad. And it was reported by some other hadith. We know also in some other hadiths uh, regarding the punishment or the uh, bliss uh, and enjoyment in the grave. So what we need to, uh, to know is to believe in this. I know that uh, all Muslims, alhamdulillah, believe in this, except very few who don't believe in the punishment of the grave. And they, they always think that the punishment will be delayed until after accountability. But in fact, a person will be given either the good news and the glad tidings of being there, of being in the uh, uh, bliss or be in the punishment of the grave because of this. And that's why we always need to be very, very prepared for this. And the, the thing is to do very well. The thing is to always be um, ready for death because we would know, we would not know in any way what will happen to us and we might die uh, at any time, at any moment. Uh, we, no, no one would guarantee that he would live or she would live for a long period of time. And I would say this because sometimes we get into these difficulties and, and, and all of that. So I think I need to stop here at this moment and I do have a break, but I'll be back with more. So please stay around. I heard it through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. Dear viewers, Hoda programs can be watched in the English section of the in-flight entertainment directory on board all Saudi airline flights, domestic and international. Sit back. Relax and enjoy watching Hoda's entertaining and enlightening shows on your trip. Hoda wishes you a safe and successful journey. Hoda, a light in every home. Through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Obviously, all what I said regarding the uh, grave punishment or bliss is, is to remind us to do well in this life, to think about the future because sometimes we care about certain things in this life that are really not as important as the hereafter. Sometimes we face difficulties and challenges and we think that the whole world is uh, over our shoulders, but it's not. We need to always think about the future. Think about what we can do, not think about what will keep us in this life because after some time, we will leave this whole world. All of the money, all the wealth, all the relatives, all the friends and, and, and matters that really keep us so uh, entrenched in this world. But we need to get free. We need to get out of this whole world and always think of the hereafter. It will make our life easier and simpler. It will make our life more enjoyable because we always are connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the things that we may face would be easily solved. And if things come to uh, a dead end or roadblock or something, obviously we always find the solution with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to our problems. That's why uh, this is the advice that I think I need to pass on uh, for my brothers and sisters in the beginning. Let me answer some of the emails that I received, and I am willing to receive your calls live here on Huda TV because, after all, we need to share all together 
all our concerns, our all inquiries, and things that are on our mind and express them. And we always look for common solutions. I learn from you. Uh, hopefully, I would be giving something of benefit to uh, my viewers. This is from uh, Shinho, who said, uh, uh, I'm Murshid, and I want to ask uh, about a dua that will help me in my board exam, because my first attempt, I failed. And I, if I'm not mistaken, probably I did answer this as the last one, as the last uh, question. And of course, uh, obviously, we need to turn to Allah. I like the question, but uh, even if, if we face difficulties, even if we fail for a first time, we can always make it up. We can always try again. And uh, the opportunity will come. And for this, you can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer your, your dua, to say, Oh Allah, help me be successful. Oh Allah, make me successful in this exam. Make it easy upon me. And you can read uh, Allah saying, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا Verily, with every ease, there are, with every two hardships, um, there, are, there is always ease. So, uh, you know, uh, no, I'm sorry. With, with every ease, there are two, two um, with every hardship, there are two eases, meaning always uh, be optimistic. And uh, you can say, Ya Mu'allima Ibrahim Alimni because Allah taught Ibrahim alayhi salam and you can say Ya Mufahima Sulaiman because Sulaiman was actually a judge and he um, passed on judgments and he uh, was taught by Allah how to understand how to uh, perceive the issues at hand and he was given this um, mentality of knowing what goes on and he would he would uh, help him in his uh, decision to take the right one. And you could say, Ya Mufahima Sulaiman Fahimni. So we have this knowledge that was given to Ibrahim and the understanding that was given to Sulaiman. You ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And basically, this is what you need is to learn and to memorize certain facts and, and particular information that will help you. But on the other hand, you need some understanding uh, so that you can always. Uh, get these things um, uh, right. This is uh, from Abu Bakr, who says, um, I am 12 years old. What do I do when my mother is angry at me? Please tell me. Well, thank you so much, Abu Bakr, and I am so glad that you're looking for uh, pleasing your mother because we know that working to please your mother and father is next to Allah's pleasure, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing was made so close to Allah's worship in the glorious Quran than to being kind to parents. Allah has made it incumbent upon him and upon everyone that you shall worship only Allah. It shall not worship anyone except him, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to be kind to your parents. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And then the ayah goes on, إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to do all these things that if uh, any of them uh, gets so old uh, uh, and then they need your help, obviously you should help them and do not find any difficulty with that. Even if you are not happy, don't, don't express your unhappiness or somehow uh, irritation when, when you're not um, really in, in the right mood to say something. You shall always keep a good smile, a nice attitude, a kind treatment, and beautiful words that you say to your mother and father. And obviously they are the best that need your help and kindness 
um, as the, the man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Man ahaqqu nasi bi sahabati ya Rasulullah, who has more right on me in my companionship? He said, your mother. Then he said, who else? And who's next? He said, your mother. He said, a third time, your mother. And then finally, he said, your father. So the mother has three rights as much as, um, as your, your, uh, your father. All right, Siba, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Siba. Can you hear me, Siba? Could you turn down your TV and listen to me directly from the phone? Siba? Hello? Yes, Siba, I'm hearing you. Okay. Go ahead. Alaykum as alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah. Oh, how are you, Shaykh? Alhamdulillah, how are you, sister? Uh, Alhamdulillah, fine, brother. Uh, I want to ask you one thing. As you know, that uh, I heard through one of the scholars that, you know, the main motivation between uh, the earlier people like uh, 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 Salahuddin or Sata Muhammad, the one who uh, free Turkey, uh, Constantinople, they, their mothers were red walls. And uh, when my children were small, I wanted to be like that. And uh, mashallah, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, today my children do follow Islam, I can say. But they're small. They're just 12 years and 10 years old. And uh, mashallah, I have taught them how to pray. They wear their girls, so they wear hijab, and they follow. But I do not see a passion in them for... Uh, to follow. They follow it as a routine. And I want to know, as a parent, what should parents do to make them, you know, have uh, that passion where they, they feel the inner passion in them for Islam or for following the rules of Islam? Okay. All right. Okay. Th Thanks. Thank you so much, Siba. Alaykum as wa rahmatullah. All right. Abu Khalid, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Did we lose him? All right. Let me go back to this question. Uh, so, obviously, I was talking about the importance of being kind to parents. And obviously, um, my friend here, Abu Bakr, would, would be asking, what should I do? Well, go ahead and, and apologize, because we are going to make mistakes. No one is immune from committing mistakes against uh, on another. Look we do make a mistake uh, of, you know, uh, against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He's so kind and we ask forgiveness and we say, Ya Allah, forgive us. Ya Allah, be kind to us. We're sorry we did this. And if we come to Allah, He will accept us. And obviously the same thing should be done to our parents. If we commit a mistake, if we uh, were not happy uh, uh, with, uh, with, if they were not happy with us, obviously, we can, we can go and apologize. Sometimes we know we irritate our parents, but at other times, maybe they have something of their own, but we should always uh, take or think uh, from their own position. Don't always say, well, I'm right and you're, you're wrong. You're an old man, you're an old lady, and you don't know how things are, and you don't feel like I feel. We don't need to do that. Because if we do that, we're not, we're not being kind. We try to be on the same footing with our parents. This is a terrible and wrong attitude. What we should do is always try to put, our, uh, to put ourselves in their shoes, imagine ourselves being the parents, what should we expect from our uh, children, basically what they need. They don't normally need materialistic things, but they need some appreciation, they need some respect, and that's what we need. All right, Abu Khalid, are you back with us? Yes, I'm back with you, Dr. Ahmed. Please. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Well, I'm very lucky to get you back, by the way. Go ahead, Alhamdulillah. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this wonderful program. And I would like to express a deep thank to Huda Channel for yes. wonderful programs. Really. The second thing, I'd like to talk about a way to make good dua and to get answered dua, mm -hmm. as the Prophet Muhammad informed us. Okay. 
Uh, this uh, way, as you know, Dr. Ahmed, is by doing good deeds, such as a prayer, zakah, fasting. And these things, when a person or any person faces trouble, he can make a, a, an answer dua by referring to these deeds. Okay. And we all know the, the, the story of uh, yes. those three persons yes. who entered a cave and they were, uh, yeah, the, the cave uh, was closed by a storm. And each one of them asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save them by referring to the most, as, as they thought, of course, the most authentic deed, good deed. And each of them, one by one, referring to good deeds, after that they were free and they get out of that cave. Right. I, you agree with me, Dr. Of course, Ahmed, of eh? course. This is uh, the way the Prophet uh, told us to do. Yes, sir, this is my contribution. Uh, right. And I'd like to express my thanks again. Jazakallah. And Jazakallah. Thank you so much, Abu Khalid. All right. Let me uh, go back to the... Uh, idea of how we please our parents, as I said, we always need to, to do that. We always need to be uh, pleased with them to try, even if we do not believe in our hearts that this is the attitude that we should take, but we should press ourselves to do well uh, for our parents, and that will help us, inshallah, be trained, and then we'll be so pleased, because sometimes our parents do not think along the same line, or maybe they are just old-fashioned, or maybe they are, uh, they, they, they think we believe that they are doing or taking the, the wrong attitude. But we can explain, explain to them softly, nicely, respectfully, that this is what we need to do, and try to be kind and soft with them. This is what we need to do. Now, regarding Sister Siba in what she uh, said earlier, obviously, I agree with her. Uh, she, alhamdulillah, she has been in contact with this program and my earlier program and channel two of the Saudi Arabian television. MashaAllah, she always speaks uh, good uh, and well of her children. And she said they follow the Islamic attitudes and, and uh, instructions. But of course, uh, sometimes, as, he, as she said, uh, they, they don't have, a, you know, have the passion, as, as she would say. Well, how do you create this passion? First, they need to take example from the parents, because if the parents are doing well, obviously we need to be good examples for them, and we need to be passionate about the Islamic teachings. That's one thing, but also set, uh, softly and nicely. I know sometimes, as parents, we turn to be strong and probably... I would say uh, harsh on them at times, but if we try to be passionate, we try to uh, tell them more about this is how, I think that will soften their hearts, that will soften their, their position, and they can see that. Uh, secondly, also, we need to uh, let them enjoy the recitation of the glorious Quran. We need to show them some good examples of Muslims and how they... I think these things will affect them, especially if they go with peers or, or teachers who are so passionate about uh, the Islamic positions. But if we tell them stories, if we uh, try to bring them to good company of the teachers, of the peers, of other family relatives, um, probably of the same age or a little uh, older than them, but not as old as we are, because there's a a, a gap in, in, in age between us and them, and sometimes they don't feel like we feel, but it does affect them. If they see us, for example, cry when we uh, hear about a story uh, of, of something bad about what is happening to our Muslim brothers and sisters, or if we, if we get so passionate by reciting the glorious Quran, or if we hear something about... Uh, for example, the punishment of the grave that I was just talking about, and if we get so much emotional about it, they would feel that. And I think that will create the passion uh, in, inside them. So it is the experience that we go through. Plus, if they are always with non-Muslims, if they are always so much attached to um, materialistic things, 
They don't get, they get, get the passion about akhira and about religion. They get always passionate about their, their things, their belongings, their, uh, their food, their, uh, you know, things that they play with. Um, you know, always because the time that we spend so much with will be reflected on our emotions. So obviously, we need to get them involved, more involved in, in the things that will get them closer and closer to Islam. And after all, we need to make dua for them. Because sometimes, as young people, they, need, they, they just need to, to go and live their own life. They, they're maybe away from us. Sometimes they spend a lot of time outside the home. They're not in direct um, contact with us. Obviously, that, that affects them. So this is something that we, we always need to watch for. And may Allah guide them. May Allah guide our Muslim youth all over. May Allah you know, keep them as, as pious and passionate about Islam as, as, as much as possible. May Allah bring them closer to the guidance of Islam and, and of course uh, Quran because that will soften their hearts uh, by Allah's will subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Abu Khalid, you always, you talked about something all right. Let me take Um Muhammad before she goes away. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullah, ya Sheikh. Yes, sister. Um, please, I'd like to ask um, if um, whether um, having a sexual thought after performing ablution um, negates your ablution. And I'd like to have a reminder of what other things that can break your ablution. What nullifies the ablution? Yes, sir. I see. All right. Okay, sister. Because sometimes one would finish ablution, then having something to think, a sexual thought coming into his mind. Right. I'd like to know whether it negates the ablution okay. or not. Okay. Okay, sister. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, going back to uh, Abu Khalid and his comment, I, I, I really appreciate that. And I think talking about dua and how important it is, obviously there are certain etiquettes and, and, and adab as we say in Islam regarding dua and how we should direct our dua. Obviously our dua will not be answered unless we eat from a halal source, uh, as the Prophet ﷺ said to his uh, companion uh, Mu'adh, Ya Mu'adh, atib mat'amak tustajab da'watuk. If we take our nourishment and food from a halal source, uh, that will be a source for uh, the uh, acceptance of our dua. Secondly, we need to be wholeheartedly with Allah in our, we need to have the devotion. We need to be directed uh, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our asking uh, of Him that is really going to uh, help us in, in accepting our dua. And of course, if we have some good deeds, it will, it will be, they will be answered by saying, Oh Allah, I did this and this for your own sake, so Oh Allah, accept from me. So we can ask Allah that we made this and we made that. This is between us and Allah, not because we need to tell people, but rather we do it between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That would be a source of, uh, of acceptance. But Allah is always there. If we sincerely ask him, he's always there. As, uh, as he said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَمَّن يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ أَإِلَهُمْ مَعَ اللَّهُ There is no one to answer you except, um, except Allah, who's there always in, in difficulties and uh, in problems. I think I need to have a break and I'll be back with you with more. So please, stay around. I heard it through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. Oh, Amazing stories. Oh, the stories of the Quran, as well as the stories that were told to us by our beloved Prophet Muhammad wasalam, are not fairy tales. They are not stories that were made up to convince us of something. They are true stories that actually happened. They said in the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ is talking. They said, Subhanallah, Baqaratun Takalam. They said, Subhanallah, a cow that speaks, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
has created this universe, my dear brothers and sisters, in such a beautiful way that everything is balanced, that every creature has a specific function, that they do not go outside of that frame. See subhanAllah how the Prophet ﷺ is telling us about the story that happened before us. And this reminds us of the fact that Islam is a universal religion. In this program, we will know about peoples from different times and places whose stories were mentioned in the Islamic tradition. All of this with Sheikh Lutfi will relate their stories and extract the lessons and wisdom behind them. The tension there, what, what about the North Korean uh, nuclear program and uh, the six uh, uh, party uh, talks? Uh, how will the tension there affect a relationship between US and China? Uh, they did that uh, early in 1993 and after long discussion and negotiation finally they stopped the program will the world be able to stop this flow of secrets will it affect international relations or were there simply um, you know basic known facts for most experts and, and most diplomats and uh, we don't know if there's more to come it's information war <laughs> brother that you oh my brother you are going through times of difficulty assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back and let me uh, go with um muhammad's question from nigeria regarding the uh, problem uh, of having some thought um, sexual thought after ablution well just the mere fact that you have some thought would not affect your ablution in any way. Your ablution is correct as long as there is no nothing that is coming uh, out, such as if there is uh, uh, a discharge of any type, either as we call it medi or medi or many, all of these, these things, because sometimes if, if the uh, idea, if these thoughts are so strong, uh, obviously something would come out of the, the vagina for a woman or from uh, a male organ and obviously that would uh, if, if something comes out then it is uh, uh, impure and we need to clean it and we need to uh, remake our ablution and uh, of course just the mere fact that you don't have you have the idea would not would not uh, uh, help and let me let me say this we need to always stay away from that uh, because sometimes I know if we uh, get possessed, if we submit ourselves, we can go away with that. And we can always think of that. And it might affect um, not only uh, our wudu or ablution, but it might affect even our prayer, our concentration. So we need to do that. The Prophet ﷺ used to, uh, when going out to prayer, he used to kiss his wife, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, so... But he was in control of himself. He was doing it when he was fasting. But as for us, we may not do that. We may not be able to control ourselves. That's why we need always to stay from anything that would arouse uh, these thoughts in our minds. And hopefully that will be uh, enough for us uh, to, to understand. All right, let me take this um, question. And I think this is again from... Uh, Nigeria, it is about if a man and a woman who intend to get married one way or the other happen to fall in zina um, and later they repented and they uh, uh, they are determined not, never to return to such acts again but still want to marry each other can they still marry one another after repenting or are there certain things that they need to uh, to do before they can marry? Jazakallahu khayran. Well, first, let me remind myself and and yours that we need to stay away from this terrible act because I think another uh, question came to me from 
one community among Muslims, and they say, the, you know, a lot of people are involved in this, and they just uh, marry these women or women marrying these men after they fall with them in zina. And, and, and you know how, how terrible zina is. It is zina or adultery or fornication is one of the grave and major sins. And there is that hadith which warns us against this, that the, um, when the Prophet ﷺ was uh, taken on, on the night journey or mi'raj into, into the heaven, and he passed by some people who were punished, who were punished, they, they, they were, were being punished even before the qiyamah is, is um, you know, would start right now in their own uh, graves and, and, and they were taken and they were just um, going ahead with, uh, they were just hanged, um, you know, in the, uh, uh, and they're, they just, I think, drink from uh, something that would come out from their own, um, you know, private parts. What we need to do is to avoid, to avoid doing this, all right? Okay, let me take Nadir from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We lost him. I know that I try to immediately take the call because I know the communication problem there. Uh, but basically, what I need to emphasize to my brothers and sisters is that we need to uh, take this act seriously. And what will prevent zina from being committed is hijab for women and for men to avoid looking at women, because Allah asks us to lower our gaze. Uh, obviously, uh, to lower our gaze is not to look and for women not to expose themselves, but rather to wear hijab and to stay away from the sight of men. That will prevent such acts. And, uh, you know, shaitan is always there and we need to avoid. But if, if a man sees a woman who's so much exposed and, and she's just like saying, here I am, or the same thing for a man, you know, showing himself and, 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 and uh, exposing himself to a woman, obviously shaitan will uh, make the connection and they would fall into this terrible, terrible uh, crime and uh, violation in, in committing zina. That's why we always need to, to, to avoid that. Now, if this happens and they need to get married, if they repent and Allah knows from them that they repent fully and sincerely, they can do it. Obviously, if people do not know that they did it, if people would, would know that they uh, did this, Obviously, it would be difficult because it will be kept on their tongues and they will always, you know, chew their reputation and they will always say something t terrible about that. All right. Matar, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. May I ask a question, please? Yes, go ahead. When my friend is asking what to do if his father sends him to buy a cigarette and his father is a smoker, does he have to obey him? How old is he, Matar? How old is uh, the boy? Uh, he is 19. 19? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Well, this is a, another, another terrible thing. Of course, when we say you have to obey your, your parents, it doesn't mean that you obey them in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah says, uh, the Prophet ﷺ says, لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق There is no obedience um, for the created in the disobedience of the Creator. Because obviously uh, smoking cigarettes is something that is prohibited without any problem. We know that for sure. And all of the people who used to say, well, Smoking cigarettes is something disliked or something that is not good but still permissible. They're saying today, after all the research and after all the uh, known facts about the effects of cigarettes, because they are cigarettes are killers and they have so many, they would be a cause of, of so many diseases, that's why they're prohibited. 
And Allah says, La darara. And the Prophet says, La darara wa la dira. All right. Nadir from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Hello? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Hello? Yes, I hear you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Please listen to me from the phone. Okay. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Good afternoon. Yes, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. So, there are right now in my room. So, yes. I just want to uh, say, may Almighty Allah bless you abundantly. May Almighty Allah reward you for what you are doing. You too. Thank you very much, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. This is all what you need to say. Anis, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum assalam. Yes, brother Anis, go ahead. Uh, Sheikh, how are you? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Sheikh, uh, can we make uh, dua in sujood uh, in uh, any language other than Arabic? In a language other than Arabic? Yes. Okay, are you doing it now? Well, I have uh, heard it from Sheikh Salah that in Salah only in uh, sujood it's uh, allowed to uh, ask dua in uh, any language other than Arabic. Okay. And you, so you're doing it now? Yes. Okay. Any other question? Nadir. Or Anis. Uh, Anis. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right. Well, okay. Let me, let me, say, let me say this regarding the question of, of cigarettes. As I said, no, this boy or man who is 19 is not allowed to go ahead and buy cigarettes for his for his father he should he should always try to uh, be kind to him in fact if he's if he is good and polite and as a good caller to islam he can always advise his father father i'd be so happy to bring you anything you want but not cigarettes please i don't want to share some sin with you so please don't smoke cigarettes. I will not buy, you, please forgive me for not buying cigarettes for you from the, uh, from the shop. I'm not willing to do it. And I think your, your, your father will be ashamed of himself. But try to do it kindly. Or just take, take the money and don't bring it. If you, if you feel. Like I know, uh, for example, a good, a good story of uh, Sheikh Muhammad Hassan, who told us uh, on one of his shows, where he said, my father, meaning his own father, used to be a smoker. And he said, I didn't know what to say to him. So he said, I cannot talk to him directly because, you know, for his own respect and because of the um, kind of uh, nice uh, relationship between me and him, I asked someone else to go ahead and do it. I asked uh, one of my friends to talk to my father, advising him not to do it. He didn't do it himself because he has so much respect of his father. I think that's a wise way to do it. You still need to respect your father, even if he's doing something bad and wrong, but in a very nice way, but don't obey him in doing this. And I think that would be a way to do certain things. All right. Now, um, regarding the uh, question of Anis, um, and, 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 and Nadir, thank you so much, by the way, to call us from Nigeria, just to say assalamu alaikum, just to say good afternoon. And it's, it's already good evening here. It's, it's uh, almost like uh, 10 o'clock in, in, in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. But mashallah, thank you so much. May Allah keep you on the straight path. And I always am happy to receive calls or emails from Nigeria and all the uh, countries around the world because... We need to advise one another. We need to help each other. Now, regarding the uh, dua or supplication inside the prayer, I know there are two opinions of scholars on this matter, but I take myself the position not to say anything in a language 
inside the salah other than in Arabic. You can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in uh, your own language uh, outside the salah, but inside the salah, because the Prophet ﷺ never uh, taught his, his uh, companions or anyone else not to say anything except in Arabic, because we know that we say Allahu Akbar in Arabic, we read Al-Fatiha in Arabic, we recite the glorious Qur'an in Arabic, we make the tasbih and the dua inside the salah in Arabic. Everything was taught to us in Arabic. That's why the scholars are saying if the person is still new to Arabic and does not know like a new Muslim, what should this person uh, say? If he doesn't know the glorious Qur'an, if he doesn't know how to read Al-Fatiha or to say anything, he should say, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. You know, just repeating these things until this person is able to, to say something uh, in Arabic, to say the glorious Qur'an in Arabic. It may take some time, but that is the way we should keep uh, our prayer intact and should keep it according to how the Prophet ﷺ uh, did it. He said, Sallu kama usalli. Pray as you have seen me pray. And we uh, saw, the companions saw the Prophet ﷺ praying in this particular way. So that's what we need to do. And I, uh, this is my advice to my brothers and sisters, but if they do it based on the fatwa of some other um, scholars, yes, go ahead and do it. But this is what I uh, feel based on the fatwa from other scholars as well. This is um, an email who said, what should I do when I feel alone? I feel depressed. I don't feel like uh, talking to anyone. I feel like my heart all heavy from inside. Could, I, could you please help me and tell me how to make my time more useful? Well, what you need to do is be connected with Allah. Don't stay alone. If you feel like you're depressed, if you stay alone, don't stay alone. Try to find some friends. Get yourself in, in, involved in um, uh, you, you know, some good work uh, and you come back to the home tired and, and ready for bed. So there is not much time for you to stay alone. If you are involved in studies or work or companionship of good people, I think that will, uh, you know, uh, ex consume your time. Even if you go out and walk in the street, if you walk in the, in the park, if in the area around you, if you involve yourself in something that is good, don't just sit alone and watch TV or uh, play with something because obviously all the bad things will come to your mind. And, and this is my advice. My advice for you is to stay away from all these terrible things. And of course, if you are with Allah, you don't feel depressed. You feel, in fact, very happy that you are with Allah. Read the glorious Qur'an. I know it may be difficult in the beginning, but try it. And read like um, one page, two pages, three pages, and think about them. Uh, think about uh, reading a good book. Think about uh, calling a good friend who reminds you. Go ahead and take a walk. All these things that would involve you in, in staying away from being alone, because if you are possessed by these ideas, they will encompass you. They will obviously press you, and you'll be so much under their influence, which you don't want to do. And uh, obviously, I have the last question. This is from Dr. Uh, um Fatima. She says, I want to educate my daughter uh, for colleging at uh, uh, Nura University in Riyadh. How would I do it? Well, you should connect them. They, they, you should contact them. They do have a website on the internet, and you can always do that. And I'm glad that you're doing this because um, Noura, uh, Princess Noura bint Abdurrahman University is, uh, is the biggest female university in the world. And I, uh, after the new campus was uh, inaugurated by the custodian of the two holy mosques about a month ago, and obviously to study in a fully uh, female environment is very helpful, and, and we avoid all the mixing between men and women, which is, which is exactly what we always need to do. And I, um, I thank you so much. I'd like to have more time, but I will stop here, uh, inshallah, hoping to see you next, uh, next week, uh, just around the same time. 
Uh, may Allah keep you on the straight path. May He help you and help all of us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to worship Him and to end our life when He's so pleased with us. Until I see you, I leave you with Allah's care and protection. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I heard it through a brother that you, oh my brother, you are going through times of difficulty. I know sometimes you feel all alone. Call me anytime when you feel all the way down. Oh, 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 oh. Trials and temptations lie at every corner we turn. It's a test from Allah to see if we succeed or not. My brother, it's a trial that Ooh. you're going through. So Ooh. don't be afraid. Ooh. Allah's there for you. So hold on. Allah's there for you. Hold on. He's listening to you. Hold on.